Um, hello and welcome to my lightning talk about Qt Quick VCP, remote user interfaces for machine tools. Um, my talk will be in four parts. Uh, first, I'm going to tell you who I, who I am. Uh, then I'm going to talk about the topic, um, the scope of the project, which uh, is evolves around machine kit and open source machine control software. Then I'm going to talk the, about the uh, user interface, the Qt user interfaces for machine kit, and, and then I will present a few applications. Okay, uh, my name is Alexander Rössler, and um, I'm actually an embedded engineer, but I'm in, evolved, uh, um, involved in Qt and uh, uh, developing user interfaces with Qt uh, longer than an MM embedded engineer, actually. I'm also involved in some open source projects uh, since of some years, and actually got involved into this project uh, because I like to play with uh, 3D printers, and I was very um, dissatisfied with the available user interfaces in this area. So, uh, first of all, what is MachineKit? Okay, MachineKit is an open source um, software for controlling machine tools or um, actually a solution uh, for machine control applications. It can be used, for example, for 3D printers, CNC machines, uh, but not only, but also it's intended to be used, for example, for robots, quadcopters, as driving layer. Um, the whole idea is that it can work on first of embedded, on embedded devices, embedded computers, but also on desktop computers, meaning Linux, uh, and the user interface itself can run on desktop computers, uh, smartphones, and uh, tablets, and also on embedded devices. And why I actually started this project was because I was very dissatisfied with which, which, uh, with the available uh, solutions. Um, Machine Kit evolved. Um, from the Linux CNC project, and for anyone who knows Linux CNC, maybe anyone here? Okay, one guy. Uh, yeah, the available user interface solutions are not very uh, sophisticated. They are basically stuck somewhere in the 90s uh, with Tika Inter and all this, uh, yeah very old school user interface frameworks. And so I started, actually started the Qt Quick VCP project. And one uh, problem to solve was actually traditional machine control applications or uh, the CNC applications uh, work on one single computer. But uh, since we're moving to embedded systems or single board computers, we have a problem. The graphical hardware is usually not uh, strong enough to handle good user interfaces. And therefore, the solution was to build a distributed system and to actually run the graphical user interfaces in, on the devices we all have uh, use every day, for example, tablets, smartphones, uh, or, or normal desktop computers. And for, to, to make this possible, um, we have developed a middleware called Machine Talk, which, which uses Serum Q, or in the case of the Qt Quick VCP and set uh, MQT, uh, a wrapper on Serum Q, uh, the Google protocol buffers, and multicast DNS, then SSD uh, for service discovery. Machine Kit um, actually is very nice, uh, not only for CNC applications, because it, it uh, allows to abstract. Um, the actual machine control uh, configuration. Uh, basically, there are components, which can be, for example, very simple and, and logic end component or more sophisticated, um, a PID controller or even a complete motion controller. And you can glue them together using signals. And so you can basically create machine control uh, systems without uh, even programming one line. And this is nice, everything, this is uh, very nice, but uh, what should we do with it, with it without uh, nice user interfaces? And so for this reason, I started the Qt Quick uh, VCP project. VCP stands for uh, Virtual Control Panel. Uh, this is what the um, user interfaces for Machine Kit are traditionally called. 
and that's where I get the name from. Uh, basically, it's a set of QML modules which can be used to build user interfaces for MachineKit. Um, to be exactly remote user interfaces, meaning they can be run on an Android tablet uh, or a desktop computer or uh, on, even on the same device. They work using Machine Talk. Uh, they're cross-platform. They work on Android, iOS, and all the desktop platforms. Of course, we're using uh, Qt. And yeah, very nice about this. Uh, the idea is that you have um, that you can remotely start new machine uh, control instances. Meaning, if you have a single computer that do, that can do many things, like for example, uh, can be used for a CNC and at the same time used for a 3D printer, or you can switch between them. Then you can start as uh, remotely. You can remotely deploy. Uh, one idea was also to have a single client for everything. So uh, as a user, you don't have to download 10 different user interfaces uh, or 10 different applications uh, just to use multiple user interfaces. And this is called the machine kit client. And you can create, basically can create two types of user interfaces. One are uh, the HAL remote user interfaces. HAL is the, the configuration layer of machine kit. And the other ones are the application or EMC enhanced machine controller user interfaces, which are dedicated to CNC machines, 3D printers, and so on. So everything that uh, uses um, this Cartesian uh, driven uh, machines, basically. Um, quick overview of our remote components and how they are uh, used inside the user interface. Uh, basically, you can think of uh, HAL as like an uh, electronic, um, like basically like electronic components uh, connected by signals, and you can just plug them together. And the idea is to have one component that basically is represented also in the user interface. And in the user interface, you can connect, uh, for example, a button, a progress bar, or whatever to this component or to the pin of the component. And uh, using this, you can quickly uh, create very sophisticated user interfaces um, for applications without uh, thinking a lot about the communication and, and everything that is involved around, uh, in, is in, usually involved in uh, when creating such a system. Yeah, uh, how does this work? Basically, uh, as I said, it does auto discovery, it does launching and everything. So you have two components. One is uh, a component that starts everything or launches the user interface. This is called connection window. You can have two types of user interfaces, local user interfaces, which are locally available and one uh, that are uh, deployed remotely. Um, you can have multicast DNSs discovery or a single cast uh, unicast DNS where you have to type basically um, IP address and on the other side you have um, what this loads basically um, is a normal user interface and so to create um, this uh, to quickly create these components uh, uh, one uh, can use either directly use a hard remote component uh, component um, com component a uh, QML component basically, but also you can create quickly uh, click together or or create user interfaces like this, which is very simple. Basically, it would create um, a hard remote component called foo uh, and with one pin uh, which is called button, and you can use this. Uh, component then in your machine configuration, basically. Uh, yeah, this is only a part of the whole QCP. You can also use uh, this application components, which can be used to uh, show G code, uh, show 3D preview, and so on. So this is there's a lot more involved, but uh, that's too much for 10 minutes. OK, and then there is the Machine Kit SDK, which is basically a set of wizards, uh, plugins, and templates, which uh, can be added to Qt Creator. So you can quickly start a new project, uh, and also can use Qt Quick Designer to click together a user interface, basically. Uh, so what are applications? First of all, I created a user interface for 3D printers. Uh, yeah, it's very... Um, so say it's it's very complete. Uh, so it has a lot of features and yeah. 
Then there's Ketos, uh, which is a replacement for the Axis user interface of Linux in the machine kit. It's for CNC, MILFs, LIFs, uh, routers, typical uh, applications uh, of machine kit. And other applications could be, uh, first of all, I'm work currently working on a commercial CNC user interface and generic uh, machine control user interfaces, small applications, prototyping, testing, and so on. Yeah, thank you very much for your attention. Uh, here are some further links. Uh, first of all, my blog, machinecoder.com, machinekit.io, uh, the machinekit project, and then the links to the GitHub, uh, quick VCP. Machinekit Vagrant to get started, uh, quickly get started, and the machinekit SDK. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, I'm afraid we don't have time for Q&A, so just reach him if you need any, uh, if you have any question afterwards. Next one. Where is the so next? Just have the obvious joke about, are you going to have this control of what they do so that we can complain at how and what they do and what they do? Sorry. Uh, it's, okay. Yeah. <laughs> no time for I, I, sorry, it. Sorry, I, uh, I could not take the 3D printer on the plane. Do you need this paper? <laughs> Here. Try it. Yes? Um, does it work? I will yeah. show those. Okay. I will show those. You need to look at me. <laughs> yeah. Okay. <laughs> Do you want to okay. just come on there? Yes. Oh, good idea. Yeah. I trust that the presentation is in QML. What? A presentation in QML, yes, it is. <laughs> um, so, yeah, double tap. So uh, yeah, welcome my to my presentation uh, about presentations in QML. My name is Daniel Buller from uh, FA Aachen, University of Applied Sciences. Uh, and I'm very interested first, uh, he does his presentations in QML already maybe? Some of us? Oh, yeah, quite, quite a, some people. So uh, how did I to come to the topic um, of doing uh, presentations in QML. Well, one and a half years ago, I uh, did my master degree and um, finished writing um, all my text in LaTeX and still had two weeks to prepare a presentation uh, for my professors. So for me, the question arised, which technology should I use to do this presentation? Um, well, it was obvious to use LaTeX for this job too, because I had already my, all my figures in LaTeX uh, and my, my content. And, uh, but I was quite unhappy with this decision because my professor is a very visual type of person. She wants a video in every presentation. Um, and so uh, I wanted to impress her and uh, also add some slick animations to my uh, presentation. So uh, I could have done these uh, animations in PowerPoint, or I could have used PowerPoint, uh, but I wanted to have a professional workflow on this and using uh, the Git versioning system, for example. So uh, uh, I've just found QML, and uh, yeah, that started working. Um, so when I'm talking about slick animations, please don't understand me wrong. I'm not talking about um, animations like this. So. completely overloaded with pointless animations. Um, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> with QML. So um, I think uh, that animations can also help your audience to understand complex topics. Um, yeah, so how ca can we get started writing um, presentations in QML? There is this um, repository on GitHub. Uh, the link to it is in the end of my presentation. and. Uh, what we need to do is write a small C++ application, which basically spawns our queue um, quick view. Uh, 
And we also can use this tool, a QML scene, which is meant to be a debugging tool, but I think it is okay to use it for uh, the presentations too. So what do we get when we, uh, when we clone this repository? Is basically um, we get two components. One co uh, component is this presentation uh, element, which cares about going to the next slide and going to a preview slide. Um, and the other component we get is the very powerful slide component, which has implementations for 90% of all the slides you will ever need. So um, what we see here is on the right is actually the code of this slide in an empty presentation, but without the code block itself, because uh, putting the code block in a code block would result in an endless recursion. Uh, yeah, and what we see here is that uh, creating these bullet points of the slide is actually um, an array of strings. And this leading, um, this leading space here uh, indicates that this bullet point should be nested one level. Uh, in the repository is also a, a great tutorial and lots of examples which uh, help you getting, quick, getting started very quickly. Um, in this repository is also a small tool called print slides which uh, lets you make PDFs out of your presentation. And this tool is very basic. What it does is it starts your presentation and um, actually just makes screenshots of every slide. So very basic, but it works if you want to make a handout of your presentation. Um, so then I brought an example of those uh, animations I was talking about. Um, my master thesis was about rendering uh, three-dimensional heat maps, volumetric heat maps. And on the right, you see the uh, geometry I sent to the, um, to the graphics card. In the original presentation, I showed, uh, I showed some code at this point. Um, and then also, uh, we can do some optimizations to this geometry, so make it look more like a data point or like a, like a point, like a sphere. And these spheres were then rendered into one big uh, three-dimensional texture, which looked like this. And we can then visualize it with a transfer function, and um, it results in such an image. So I could have done um, an animation like this using videos and play and pause a video every time. But um, for this, I actually could use um, my application code and put it directly into the slide. So I basically skipped the step of making videos and, um, and cut them and could use it directly. Later on, I... Uh, recognized how powerful it is to put your application code directly into a slide. And this is the next use case. Um, yeah, you could, can put your whole um, front end into your application and just maybe discuss it with uh, some discuss an early prototype of your application with uh, some stakeholders. And it is also interactive at this point. Here. Yeah. And one and a half years ago, it was also a bit hacky to get this 3D content into your uh, presentation. Nowadays, we have Q3D, which can be in integrated into a slide easily with this component. And for the ones of us who made the training day yesterday or, or know it, this um, component registers uh, the input aspect also here. And this makes the component completely interactive inside the presentation. So. This is very fancy, and if that is not enough, we also have um, charts we can add in our presentations. Uh, since Qt 5.7, these are available for the open source developers. Uh, yeah, this is a bar chart, and we also have uh, pie charts, and they can be animated too, so have a look. Yeah, and I was very surprised when I saw how view lines of code are needed to include such an um, such a chart into the, uh, the slides. We have a chart view here for the, um, the pie chart, and inside is the actual pie chart. The chart view is configured to enable all animations, and then we see down here there is one pie slice, which should um, which sets its exploded um, property to true when the slides proceeds three steps. And this is what triggered the animation we just saw. 
So the key of being efficient when creating QML uh, presentations is uh, using components. You can, uh, or creating your own components you can reuse very often. And I found myself very often comparing different images of different um, approaches. So I came up with this component, which uh, lets me compare uh, different approaches uh, with my audience. And the other component uh, I added is this uh, progress indicator, you hopefully already noticed, which we know from LaTeX. Yeah, the bottom line is uh, lots, uh, it, it offers a lot of possibilities, and the simple things can be done simple. And uh, yeah, the more complex slides also take, of course, a lot, a bit of effort. Um, it would be nice to have more components and also to have some more tooling. So me as a presenter here, um, I can I have a small window with uh, with notes maybe, but I can't see the next slide. So for a 10 minute presentation, that is okay, but there wouldn't be a tool to show me the next slide here. Um, and also I use the smartphone for, as a timer. That would be nice to have, <laughs> maybe. Um, so um, all the KDAP people here are doing, I think they're doing their slides very often also in QML, but they have this um, application called Slide Viewer, and it is very. It seems to be very powerful. So maybe um, if there's enough demand, one time this might be available to the pub, uh, to the public maybe. But until now, we have um, this QML presentation system with um, the link shown here, uh, and also my own fork of it, which uh, contains these two components I talked about, and the ability for a slide to have multiple states to have these animations in. So thanks a lot for your attention. Thank you very much. Okay, next one. All right, my name is Michael Timms. I'm here to talk about a native QML location API that we've put together at Esri that's focused on scripters or web developers with a JavaScript web uh, background. I work um, uh, at Esri uh, on our product that's called the ArcGIS Runtime SDK for Qt. And just quickly agenda, so we'll go uh, just a little bit about why we're doing this, what we're doing, QML API for JavaScript developers. I'll show you a demo, a couple demos. Um, I'll go over just a couple extra APIs that we've had to expose to QML because they're not in the Qt framework um, to be able to support our SDK, and then I'll follow it up with a, with a, with a summary. Okay, so QML for JavaScript developers at Esri. Well, so why design a, a, a native API in QML for web developers that uh, only requires you to know some sort of web technology and no C++ required. At Esri, we've built a pretty good foundation on uh, the web technology. Uh, we have a lot of people that are attracted to our technology and they come with an HTML5 or a web background. But the industry, you know, these, these organizations want to build apps that run on the desktop, not only the desktop, but mobile devices. They want to put their apps in stores. They want to be able to bring your own device and have the application running on your device. Um, and that's where we've come in and we've built our entire location API and exposed it to QML. 
No C++ skills are required because you're basically programming against our API all in QML with JavaScript business log logic. Um, we'll get better performance than hybrid or web technologies, probably not as good as performance of our C++ API because we also have a C++ API. Um, but, you know, we're going to get some pretty good performance and we've been able to prove that. Um, most of these users have never envisioned that they would be able to write a mobile app that's, that they actually wrote for iOS or Android that's not running in the web browser. Um, these are, and we've, we've gotten a huge amount of these developers. They're being exposed to the Qt framework. Most of them never even knew what QML was before, um, but now they do, and they're you know, programming against QML and, uh, and using JavaScript. So just going to step you through a couple demos just to kind of give you a feel for the API. Here I have an application that when I spin up, uh, it's going to bring up a world imagery map. And I'm going to click this button to just zoom to this Yellowstone spring. And nice, simple little application as long as the network comes up. And this application just real quickly, you know, zooms into this spring on the screen. So let's take a look at the code behind. How do you do this in just QML? Well, we have this API where we start out by declaring a map view. Let me just blow that up a little bit. Nest a uh, map, and that imagery map that you saw is our base map, and that goes into our map. You can think of our map as a model to our map view. And that's really all you had to do to really get that map up on the screen. So then when they start wanting to interact and write logic, say they have this button and on click they want to zoom to the spring, you can declare our different geometry types. And this is just a point that's with a geographic point that's, uh, that we can zoom to. Um, and within this zoom to spring function, we can dynamically declare our types uh, in QML. So we'll declare this viewpoint center type and give it that location uh, on the screen. And then we just, on our view, say we want to set the viewpoint uh, with four seconds, so it'll take four seconds um, to zoom to that particular location. And that was all in QML with some uh, JavaScript logic. And it, it gets a little bit more detailed than that, obviously, but this is just a simple example. Um, also available for QML JavaScript developers is our 3D technology that we'll be bringing uh, to our API as well. So we'll be, to be able to come in here and if the network is being nice to me, we can s come in here and we can look at our, our scene. And we call this a scene layer. And this is running in a scene view. It'll take a little while to texturize the buildings because it, you know, the network connection. But you can come in here and you can work in 3D now, running on the desktop, running on my, my native platform, and um, run everything in 3D uh, using QML. So let's take a look at that language. I know that didn't load up, but uh, come by and see me if you want to see a little bit more about 3D. But this is similar to what we had with the 2D map. Instead of a map view, we have a scene view uh, with a scene. Same thing, the base map imagery with labels was the base map we were using. Uh, we also have in here a surface. So this is an elevation source, and this is how we get elevation to our 3D. Um, so we are just hitting our ArcGIS backend services to give us elevation. And then we have this scene layer, and this is that scene layer of San Francisco that we had, and we wait for it to be loaded before we set the viewpoint to be its extent. So that's where we got the effect where it, it loaded up and then it, it zoomed into San Francisco. But this is all basically just using JavaScript and, and you know, cute quick QML uh, language syntax. So um, this is really attractive for our developers to be able to write these apps. Um, just knowing QML, and they're, they become, you'll be surprised, the JavaScript developers that come from the web, um, they can get up and running with this language very, very quickly. It's, it's, it's been really nice for us to um, be able to have them get up and running uh, super fast. So back to the slides, um, just a little bit about uh, how, how uh, some other things we'd had to do to be able to support what we're doing um, with our QML API. 
um, we're missing just simple file I.O. in QML. You might be able to get some third-party JavaScript stuff that does it, or you might be able to work that in. But we want something that's written in QML so they can, they can declare a, f a file info type and be able to, you know, copy it around or detect if it exists and things like that. Because we're a native API, we have support for offline. Everything that you just saw will have support to be able to run that all offline. We can't rely on uh, the web all the time. Same with, you know, net, different network APIs, something we've worked on being able to, you know, download these files, put them to disk on the device so that we can access them uh, from the API. And we want to expose more of these APIs from the, you know, your standard Qt C++ types and, and up to QML so that our JavaScript community can take advantage of those. And then we plan on contributing things, these back to Qt um, if, you know, if necessary, if they get, if they get accepted. And that's, you know, another story. Uh, that's a little washed out, but this is just an example of, you know, our QML file info class. So you just, you declare this and register it with QML, give it a couple properties where, you know, you have the, the path specified to the file, be able to detect if it exists. And then down at the bottom is just an example of how you declare one of these file info types to a certain path. Here I have a file geodatabase. This is a this is a data a SQLite geodatabase format that we accept in our our API with the ArcGIS platform, and uh, you can just work with you know file I/O operations just directly in QML. So in summary, um, we want to attract a large developer audience from the web community, and that is happening, um, and we're very pleased by that. We cannot have any C++ required. Um, as you all probably know, because you are cute developers, that at least there's a little bit of C++ there needed to launch the application. Well, we just ship a template with, with our SDK to, that has that already ready to go for them. So they don't have to write that. Um, they should never even have to look at that. Uh, they just need to get up and running with their main QML and, and go from there. Um, it's very important for us to handle asynchronous processing on our back end. So we produce the API and we write it all in C++, expose it up, uh, run the asynchronous operations uh, in C++ code, and then notify when those are done back to the QML uh, API uh, when they're done. So we can do all the heavy lifting. There shouldn't be a lot of business logic that's being written in JavaScript against our API. We want to handle as much of that as possible. Out of the box models to plug right into list view, you know, QML list views, path views, uh, whatever it may be, uh, so they can just work directly with uh, with some of our data types that we expose right out of the uh, QML API. If you want to get a little bit more info, we'll have the progr programming in the geographic context session tomorrow from 1:45 to 2:45 in the afternoon. We'll go a little bit more into our SDK. We'll even, we'll touch on more of our C++ API as well in there. Um, and then here's some information about, uh, a little bit more information, our website, developers.arches.com slash cute. And that's it for me. Thank you. We have one more. Don't leave yet. <laughs> I think it's me. Oh, but but I thought we have only only one one more end user and yeah, now. Yeah, it's me. It's you. Yeah, but I think there is someone after me. Okay. Large traces in QML profiler should be here, right? In Seventy-eight. But I don't see it in the list. I have it in my list. <laughs> I don't know why you don't see it. <laughs> I think it was was on the sheet of paper, but up front. But... <laughs> Is it in the app? Yeah, that's mine. Okay. <laughs> okay, then do it.
Now we have the talk about end users and QML in Rolly stream. I don't know what it is. Okay. Hi everyone. Uh, I'm Bruno Gezenek, and I'm the lead developer of a project called Rollis Team. Um, ah. I don't know. Um, <laughs> Rollis Team is a um, virtual tabletop software to play role playing games written in uh, C with Qt under GPL, uh, GPL2. Um, it's a software to player from around the world play together uh, through the network, obviously. Um, <coughs> as you may know, um, as you may know, to play role-playing games, you need character sheets. Um, it's, um, and um, I will say, manage, managing them, it's a, a, bit, a, bit, a little bit difficult. Um, firstly, because the character sheet is gathering all data about a character. And those data needs to be accessible by other parts of the software, such as um, a dice roller, for example. Secondly, each game has its own character sheets, um, which requires a high level of um, customization. Um, and to, to fit this needs, um, there is, I think, two solutions. First, as many of my competitors uh, they choose uh, HTML, and I don't want to go that way because it's too easy. And uh, as a uh, Rollis Team is a cute application, uh, the um, the um, um, uh, sorry, <laughs> um, the um, expected solution for me was a uh, QML. I mean, uh, it's uh, a, a great challenge. And um, also, it's uh, a better way to improve my skill in QML. So let's go with QML. But one problem is that uh, end users are not QML developers, and I need those end users to be able to create uh, character sheets for their games. Um, so the main challenge becomes to provide an easy way to create uh, character sheets and um, to initiate them on QML coding. To do so, I create a Rolly Slim character sheet editor. Obviously, his name uh, uh, explains what he does. Um, so the first feature of the, this software is to design the user interface. Basically, you, you drop a character sheet background and put field at the right place. Of course, field, can be, uh, field properties can be amended, such as positioning, background color, uh, font, so on, and so on. Um, then, when, uh, when set, you can, the editor can generate the QML code, and you, can, and you are able to, to see the result. Uh, it's, uh, it's displayed exactly as it will be in Rollis Team, because uh, both software share the same code. And, um, uh, and also, um, uh, and also um, the QML code is also displayed. Uh, it's, uh, it's offering a good um, opportunity to study the QML code. Um, as, I, as you can see, um, some uh, fields are custom uh, QML uh, items, but I designed to update data from, from my model and uh, to be adep 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 uh, adapted by m my model. <coughs> um, okay, then when the user are confident enough, they can 
Uh, edit the QML code to add some uh, features, just like animation, transition, or even behavior. If they want, if they want, they can also connect the character sheet to uh, PostgreSQL database if they want. I don't know. Anything possible with uh, QML as the language uh, is become bigger and bigger. So uh, when all of these steps are done, the last one is to um, play with it. So you have to load the character sheet into World Steam, and uh, and let's go. So I have a little video for you. First, I will start World Steam as a game master, kind of a super user. Then I start another World Steam instance as a player. I did this video yesterday, so it's a little bit long. <laughs> then the, the game master load a character sheet database and share one character to the player. And the player gets uh, its character sheet. And we'll see that uh, the player try to edit the level value and the, and the GM gets the updated value. Of course, it, I will implement uh, permission uh, management to prevent cheaters. And uh, I think it's all for me. Uh, I hope you enjoy the presentation. Uh, this link uh, can help you if you want more details about World Steam. Uh, um, and uh, thanks for your attention. Okay, by the way, the presentation was also a QML application. And you can, it's free also, you can get it on my uh, GitHub uh, account. So, next. Hello. Ah. <laughs> Great. <laughs> this is bad. Does this work? Nope. <laughs> yeah, no, that is not the intended effect. Okay, whatever. Let's try it like this. Um, any of you? Oh, no, this doesn't work. Well, 
Now you can see something, but I can't. Okay, we can try it like this. <laughs> Okay, I'm Ulf Hermann. I've been working on the QML profiler since 2013, basically. If any of you uh, used the QML profiler yet? Oh, ah, quite a few people. Now maybe you know the effect. Um, basically, you uh, uh, profile an application and generates a lot of data and it takes for ever to load the data. It's loading and loading and loading and loading and eventually it runs out of memory and crashes. Um, we don't have that much time here, so I'm going to do that exercise right now, if I can do that actually blindly. Yeah, yeah, seems like a cat, seems like a can. So this is a pretty big trace, it's like one gigabyte. And I'm going to start to load it now, while I'm talking. So what is the problem? <laughs> Um, uh, basically, you have an application that um, performs badly. Why is it performing badly? Because it does a lot of things. It runs a lot of JavaScript functions, um, it executes a lot of bindings, sets a lot of signals around, um, uh, all that stuff that make it generate a lot of trace data. Um, that trace data has to be stored somewhere. First in the application where it's recorded, then it has to be sent over the network or over a local socket to Qt Creator. Then it has to be stored again, and then it has to be uploaded in a transformed form to the graphics card. And somewhere in the process, well, that can be pretty heavy on your, on your memory. Um, however, obviously, those applications are the most interesting ones to profile. You actually want to know what's going on. Um, and there are two ways to tackle this. First. I've done some things in Qt Creator 4.1 and in Qt 5.7 to uh, uh, reduce the memory footprint of those things. And we're going to see that in a minute. Um, uh, basically, it uh, uses smaller data structures for everything. It doesn't duplicate the file names and the function names and so on, um, uh, but only uh, 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 sends the timestamps and the uh, um, and IDs for the functions and stuff like that. Uh, it compresses the timeline when uploading to the GPU. So if there are too many events, um, uh, so that they wouldn't fit in the GPU memory, uh, it basically compresses multiple of them into one uh, geometry block that's uploaded. So that saves some space. Um, uh, it uses uh, temporary files now to store the actual trace data, so it isn't all kept in memory in Qt Creator. And you get a new data format that's 10 times smaller because it's binary rather than XML. So let's see what it's done. Apparently, um, the computer is still running, so it has crashed, I hope. So this is the trace it has loaded. Um, you can technically interact with that, but it's kind of a pain. This is Qt Creator 4.0, so this is before my uh, changes. That's why it's red. I also have a green one that you'll see in a minute that will be Qt Creator 4.1. Um, and we should be able to check how much memory it took. Um, let's make that a big bigger so that I can actually see it. And let's see how much memory Qt Creator is actually using at the moment. So you see those two Qt Creators here in the process list. Um, uh, one is 4.0, that's apparently number 2423. Uh, two, two, and the other one is 4.1, we haven't used that yet. Um, uh, Two, four, two, three, huh? Just now, uh, that thing uses about uh, 10 gigabytes of virtual memory and um, 8.5 gigabytes roundabout are actually memory allocated, hardware memory allocated to that process. So that's quite heavy and I'm not going to load uh, the other uh, trace in parallel to that. So let's close that quickly here. 
but this is Qt Creator 4.1, and we are going to do the same experiment with this one. Right, let's see if I can still do it. So with Qt Creator 4.1, you know, uh, see there's also a separate option here. Um, uh, I promise you this is the same data. You could try it at home. <laughs> and it's uh, 10 times smaller because it's the data, uh, the, the uh, binary data format rather than the XML data format. And I'm going to load that now. Meanwhile, I can tell you what you can do to reduce the memory footprint of your QML traces. First, you should only record what you're interested in. Um, uh, I can tell you the most expensive thing to record are uh, memory usage events. QML allocates a lot of memory, and each and every memory allocation is recorded and sent to Qt Creator if you record them. Um, uh, if you're not interested in that, better switch it off. Um, uh, second, um, every binding and every signal handler is also a JavaScript function call. So if you're not interested in the uh, uh, bindings and signal handlers as bindings and signal handlers especially, uh, you can switch that off and just look at the JavaScript function calls and you'll see all the stuff too. You don't see binding loops and uh, you don't necessarily see how, uh, which signals trigger the um, JavaScript functions, but usually you see the same thing. Um, uh, then, uh, since Qt 5.6, uh, Qt can actually uh, periodically flush the trace uh, cache. So you can specify in Qt Creator, I'll show that in a minute, um, uh, that uh, it should instruct uh, QML to send the trace data every such and such milliseconds and clear the cache to make room for new trace data. Uh, that should prevent the application to run out of memory. Um, however, that has a cost, of course. Sending the trace data takes some time and might distort your profile. You have to do your own experiments with that. Uh, and finally, you can use the uh, binary trace data file uh, format uh, to get 10 times smaller traces. So let's see. This one has loaded the trace. It's somewhat faster and somewhat easier to use than the other one. And let's hope it also takes less space. So this is... Um, Two, four, three, seven, huh? Okay. Yeah, this one uh, takes about four gigabytes of uh, virtual memory and uh, only about 2.3 gigabytes are actually hardware memory allocated to that process. So that's a reduction of like more than 60% or something like that. Just between Qt Creator 4.0 and Qt Creator 4.1 for the same trace. And I'll show you the respective options here. So if you want to uh, limit what the thing is going to record, before recording, you can switch stuff off in this menu here. So if I see that right, this is memory usage, and now it's off. And you won't get this memory usage category then. Mind that uh, the recording button is something else than the filter button. The filter button is a pure UI thing. You can like filter out the memory usage and then display it again, but that uh, doesn't make it disappear. Um, uh, the flush interval is either in the global settings or in the uh, project specific um, run settings and it's this. Basically you switch it on, you set some interval, this is one second, you can set it to five seconds or whatever, and there you go. Uh, okay. Yeah, okay. Thank you. And 
We have a party for everyone at uh, six thirty with free beers. <laughs> you can go there now. It's the time for it. <laughs>